ஹலோ வெல்கம் டு என்பிடிஎல் என்ஓசி என் இன்ட்ரோடக்டரி கோர்ஸ் ஆன் பாயிண்ட் செட் அப்பாலஜி பார்ட் டூ மாடியூல் ஃபோர் ஸோ இந்த பாஸ்ட் த்ரீ மாடியூல்ஸ் வி ஹவ் பீன் ப்ரிப்பேரிங் ஃபார் ப்ரூஃப் ஆஃப் இம்பிளிசிட் அண்ட் இன்வர்ஸ் ஃபங்க்ஷன் தியரா லாஸ்ட் டைம் வி ஆல்சோ சா த ஸ்டேட்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் த இம்பிளிசிட் ஃபங்க்ஷன் தியரா so let me just uh, recall the statement again i have explained the statement last time so let me just recall this one now only v and w are banach spaces y is any topological space m cross n b an open subset of y cross v and a function capital f from m cross n to w which is continuous then it satisfies three more conditions what are they for some point y not v not inside m cross n f of y not v not is zero for each y inside m the function fy which sends v to capital fyv that is differentiable as a function from n to w and its derivative for each y i have so the derivative function from m cross n to b v w that is continuous and the derivative at y not v not namely g y not v not is similarity between v and w okay in particular v and w are similar Okay, Banach spaces, isometric Banach spaces. Then there exists rho positive and an open neighborhood M prime of Y naught inside M and a function G from the closed ball of radius rho around V naught. Okay, oh, sorry, from M prime to the closed ball. such that f of y g y is zero moreover this function g from m prime to b rho b rho bar v not is continuous you see the first conclusion the second conclusion conclusion b here requires one more hypothesis namely assume y is also a banach space and the function restricted to y not v not from this m to w namely f y v not operating upon y is the capital f of y v not this is differentiable at y not and its derivative is h then g will be differentiable at y not and the derivative of g is given by minus t inverse h okay so let us start uh, proving this one now there are a number of steps to be taken so that we understand what is going on so the proof is broken up into smaller steps the first step is i want to make a simplification in the statement as well as in the proof namely i would like to bring this t to be identity map how can i do that namely by composing with t inverse from with w and as if we are working now all the time inside b okay compose t inverse don't go to v at all w at all keep coming into v that means you can assume that v and w are actually the same space instead of similarity so how do how this is what i want to do so how do i do that so as follows namely put f hat replace f by f hat which is t inverse of f 
remember f was from m cross v m cross n to w now it will be n cross n to v itself okay so that's all now suppose we have proved this theorem to f hat okay in this special case then we can go back to uh, the original by, by pre again composing by t okay so if we replace f by f, f hat then the derivative of this one will be now t t inverse into t which is the identity at the point y not v not okay because the derivative of a linear uh, automorphism whatever it is is itself so when you by by composition law by by chain rule derivative of this f uh, uh, t inverse composite f will be t inverse composite derivative of f so that will be identity so this is what we want to uh, assume so that writing down the proof will become easier i don't have to keep on writing t here that's all no? okay so that is the first step all right maybe we will do use this one only for a as soon as we have proved it for this special case we know that it is true for the general case also because all that i have to do is apply the same thing t composite that thing to get back to our f okay in the step 2 now we have the modified hypothesis okay all 1 2 3 are all modified namely this now w is v itself so m cross v to v we have got a function instead of m cross v to w okay so i am writing m cross v to v now you take the function new function s defined by s of y v equal to v minus f of y v f is a function from m cross n to w okay so define s of y v equal to v minus f of y v okay for every point see f is defined earlier f was defined from m cross n so so this function will be defined on now m cross n again okay for every point zero less than for every epsilon between zero and one let us have this short notation instead of writing all the times minimum of epsilon and half okay c epsilon we claim that there exists an open set m prime such that y not is inside m prime contained inside m and a positive row such that s restricted to the uh, restricts to a function from m prime cross the closed ball goes inside the closed ball and satisfies this inequality this is our first step part of this remember is existence of this m prime and rho this was a part of a right but the conclusion is slightly you know in between conclusion is a weaker conclusion we are not yet saying that there is a unique g and etc g hasn't yet appeared the first thing is the new function s has this property namely s of y v1 minus s of y v2 is less than c epsilon times v1 minus v2 for every y in m prime v1 and v2 are inside the closed ball remember this was nothing but a uniform contraction so so we are up to now applying contraction mapping which was done in the first module remember that right so first we have to claim this one so first let us get the proof of this part okay so that is the 
okay so how to prove this one g of y not v not is identity now right so earlier it was just a similarity t in the new hypothesis it's identity by continuity of g we first select a neighborhood m prime of y and a row positive such that g y v minus identity is less than c epsilon so this is where the continuity of the derivative in the second variable that is used okay this g was the differentiation of capital f right with respect to the second variable v so by continuity of this some neighborhood of y not and some neighborhood of v not will go inside that in the neighborhood of v not i can choose to be a uh, open ball of course i can take it smaller than then i can take the closed ball also no problem but for m prime for neighborhood of y not y is some arbitrary space so just some neighborhood i don't have any balls there yet okay for every y comma v inside m prime cross this one this is true now use the continuity of f v not we can replace m prime by a smaller neighborhood if necessary so that f of y v not is less than rho time rho by 2 for every y inside m prime so there is a choice of m prime at the second stage first stage is some m prime that is replaced by smaller m prime this m prime will depend upon the rho the rho is chosen in the first instance then i am choosing m prime in a smaller than that okay so m choice of m prime will depend upon the rho to make it less than rho by 2 see here if i had kept original t then i had to write a norm of t inverse here okay so i have i have this becomes easier because just rho by 2 i can just get all right next i come to take a fix take some point m prime m, y in m prime okay m prime has been cut down neatly now put sy of v equal to s of yv remember what was s of yv s of yv is by definition is v minus f of yv okay so so now i am just writing this sy of v wherein thinking this as a function of v y is fixed s of yv now the derivative of s of y with respect to v is nothing but you see v the der derivative is identity this part is the f this is g g of y v prime okay i am just using this formula this definition here is derivative of this one is identity minus the derivative of f all right so identity minus g of y v prime therefore the norm of this which less than equal to norm of identity minus g of this one that is less than equal to c epsilon c g minus identity less than equal to c epsilon that is 14 so that is the choice of m prime here you get the first choice second choice is smaller than so that is also l for that okay so i have this one less than equal to identity minus so c epsilon It's less than good half because c epsilon is minimum of epsilon and half for every y and v prime belonging to m prime cross the closed ball b rho v one. Okay, once the derivative is less than to half, we know that s y of v two minus s y of v one is less than or equal to this constant lambda one by two times v two minus v one. Okay. right so this is the mean value theorem that you have proved i mean mean value inequality for every y v prime belonging to m prime cross b rho bar of v0 so what is this one 
this constant is less than 1. Therefore, this is a contraction mapping. Okay. In order to apply the contraction mapping principle, we have yet to show that this SY takes the closed ball inside the closed ball. Then the closed ball in a Banach space is a complete metric space on its own. Then we can apply contraction mapping. Okay. So next step we have to do this one. So here I have made a remark. The choice of M prime depends upon rho. Okay. So you can see that because in the second step here, we have already chosen rho and now we are using the, uh, the continuity of this Fp prime, the second in the second slot to make it as the second, the first slot smaller. The second slot is fixed here as a function of y, it has become smaller, that's all. Okay, so we have to prove that the closed ball goes inside the closed ball under Sy. Okay, so that we can think of Sy as a contraction mapping inside this metric space, which is a complete metric space. So why this is true? Take any V such that norm of V minus V naught is less than or equal to rho. That means a point of the ball. Then Sy of V minus V naught, I should say that this is also less than or equal to rho. So that will prove this statement. So I am looking at the norm of this one. Now here you add and subtract Sy of V minus Sy of V naught minus sy of v naught what it is this minus 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 v naught huh? so sy of v minus sy of v naught plus this is f of y v naught okay so f of y v naught look at this definition f is sy Okay, minus this one. This is minus of minus, that will be plus. Norm when you take, they are the same. F of y v naught is this. Okay, we bring at this one, this one on this side. So v minus this one. Okay. Now what I am telling here, S of y v naught here, F y v naught minus v will be equal to F of y v naught. With a negative sign, the norm will be the same. Okay. So, this norm we have seen is already less than or equal to V minus V naught by 2. And this norm is less than or equal to rho, rho by 2. So, that is the second choice here. Where is the second choice that we have made here? F of Y V naught norm is less than or equal to rho by 2. Okay. So rho by two, rho by two is less than or equal to I mean, some of this one is less rho. Okay. It started with V minus V naught is less than or equal to rho here. So norm of V minus V naught by two is rho by two. Okay. So what we have proved is that S Y for each y, fixed y, is a contraction mapping of the closed ball v bar rho v naught. Okay. So now we can come to the proof of the statement A, that is the step 3. V is a Banach space, every closed ball in it is a complete metric space. Therefore, by step 2, we can apply a contraction mapping theorem to conclude that Sy has a unique fixed point. We define G by M prime to G is M prime to M prime is the points where in Y varies, right? Into B bar rho by the formula Sy of GY is GY. 
okay so fixed point of sy for each y there is only one unique map that is important there is one unique uh, point inside this ball by definition sy of v this is equivalent to saying that fy gy is zero because sy of uh, v is nothing but v minus f of v sv right so f of y g y is zero will be s of y will be v so it follows that for each y in m prime g y is unique okay for each y in m prime g y is unique that is the uh, conclusion of the contraction mapping in particular g y not has to be v naught because y naught is already going to v naught under f y f of v naught y uh, y naught v naught is zero that was the high starting hypothesis so g of y naught has to be v naught the continuity of g is a direct consequence of part b of the contraction mapping theorem which we have proved in the first part in the uh, in the first module Okay, this is SY is continuous in Y, then this is continuous was following that. That is what we have proved. That. So this proves part A. All right, the proof of part B. Since now we now assume that Y is a Banach space, second part, we may assume that m prime is a convex neighborhood of uh, of uh, this y naught of this y naught in both is 14 and 15 right in the beginning you can assume this is uh, convex in smaller things also you can choose again convex set so here in these two okay so choice of m prime being convex doesn't make sense in an op or arbitrary topological space. So we couldn't have said right here. But once we know that Y is a Banach space, we can make this one a convex set also. Okay, convex neighborhood of the point Y naught. So having made that demand on M prime, let us continue now for the proof of this part. Okay, here. Okay. By theorem 1.21, now because of convexity, along with this uh, hypothesis 14, what happens? F of y v minus f of y v naught minus v minus v naught. See, there was a t here. Now t is identity. It less than it to C epsilon times V minus V naught for every Y V in M prime cross B bar of rho. Okay. So this was the mean value inequality. Okay. We have proved this theorem 1.21. Y belonging to M prime put V equal to GY in this formula. Then f of y g y minus f of y v naught minus v is g y right g y minus v naught is less than to c epsilon times g y minus v naught. Therefore, f of y v naught plus g y is minus f of y v g y plus plus v naught is there. So I am taking only this part now f of y v naught plus g y minus v naught is less than equal to c epsilon times g y minus v naught. Why? Because f of y g y is 0. So because I am taking a norm, I can convert all these negative signs into positive sign. Okay, This minus sign will become plus, this plus sign will become minus sign. So f of y g y is 0 by choice of g y. Okay. So part b of theorem 1.1, namely the continuity part, 
taking f equal to s and v equal to g, we get g y minus v naught is less than or equal to distance between g y and v naught, which is distance between g y. What is v naught? Is g y naught? That is less than or equal to one divided by one minus epsilon. See, I am going to use the full statement of part p of theorem one point one, which I have told you. Namely, the inequality that we have established there. Norm of g y minus v naught. We didn't write it in the terms of norm, but we didn't write it in the matrix notation. Is g y v naught, which is g y g g v naught. This was less than or equal to one divided by one minus epsilon. Distance between g y and s of y v naught. Now go back. Figure this distance is uh, given by the metric here. Uh, this metric is given by the norm here, so I can replace it by norm. So one divided by one minus c epsilon, g y minus s of y v naught. Okay, but this is by definition f of y v naught, definition of s. Okay, now you use the fact that c epsilon is the minimum of epsilon and one by two, so it is less than equal to one by two. So so this one divided by one minus epsilon is less than equal to two. Okay, so this whole thing is less than equal to twice f of y v naught. Therefore, go back now. G y minus v naught plus f of y v naught. Okay, that will be less than twice c epsilon times f of y. All that we want is. Some constant here. Okay, it depends upon C. It may be three times, may be four times. That doesn't matter. Okay, so let us write f of y v naught as h of y naught v naught times operating upon y minus v naught plus the remainder. Why we can write it as because this is the derivative of f. Okay, with respect to the y coordinate, v naught is fixed here. Okay, y minus y naught I am taking because it's the derivative with respect to the uh, y coordinate here. So R y, R y is the remainder after uh, n terms after our first term. This has a property that R y divided by norm of y minus y naught tends to zero, as y tends to zero. Okay, so I'm using the increment theorem here. Therefore, if you use this in in this uh, inequality that we have established, what we get is g y minus v naught plus h of y naught v naught minus y y minus y naught. This term. Okay, so I replace f by this plus this one. So g y minus v naught. Plus this term is f y minus r y. So this term I have taken is g y minus v naught is as it is. This term is replaced by f y minus r y. Okay, but this part we have already shown twice f y plus f y v naught. Therefore, I can add plus norm of r y. This is triangle inequality. Okay, this term is less than equal to this term plus this term. C twice C epsilon F Y V naught norm plus norm of R Y. But that is same thing as now. We go back. F Y V naught is this plus this. So H of Y naught V naught Y minus Y naught plus twice C epsilon plus one plus one more here. This twice C epsilon. It comes from here, and one here, one extra term comes from here. So this much plus into R Y. Okay, dividing out by Y minus Y naught, the Y minus Y naught term comes from here. Norm, this is a linear map, right? So norm of this is less than equal to norm of this into norm of Y minus V naught. Okay, you divide out by this. Take the limit. What we get? 
this divided by take divided by y minus y naught take the limit this is just zero because this is the derivative of this one okay so we get gy minus v naught plus h of this y minus v naught where y minus y naught as y tends to this one okay is less than or equal to you see epsilon twice epsilon y minus v naught y this is there plus r y is there divided by y minus y naught this tends to zero no i mean doesn't matter what this constant is right so this part vanishes this part will remain okay but it is twice c epsilon times norm of h y h y not v not the norm of y y minus y not term cancels out okay so i repeat when you take the limit this term vanishes because r y divided by y minus y not tends to zero With this term y minus norm of y minus y not comes out and that has gone down you divide divided so that term remains okay so this is true for all epsilon positive right that's what i told some c epsilon twice three times whatever you don't care so we get that for every epsilon i have taken c epsilon to be minimum of epsilon and half okay so if this is true then this left hand side limit must be zero what is this this limit tells you that g is differentiable at v not with h as its derivative that is the definition of differentiation sorry minus h as the derivative there is a plus sign here okay so this completes the proof of part b and thereby completes the proof of the implicit function theorem i recall that in the original statement there was a t inverse here but now in the in the modified statement we have made t to be identity map that is why the t doesn't appear here okay so that is a proof of implicit function theorem now let us go to inverse function theorem there is one step ahead but this is the crux of the fact this is the main thing that we want to prove finally v and w are banach spaces u is an open subset of the first banach space v f is a function from this open set into w the condition on f is that its continuously differentiable function and its derivative at a particular point v not is a similarity okay the conclusion is that there exists a neighborhood of v not such that f on that neighborhood to its image is a homeomorphism fn is open in w moreover f inverse is also continuously differentiable so starting with just a continuously differentiable function which is such that at one point the derivative is invertible in a small neighborhood the function itself is a homeomorphism actually a diffeomorphism because inverse is also continuously differentiable moreover on to the image is also open both n and fn are open n is open in v and fn is open in v the hypothesis that f df v not is similarity automatically implies that v and w are similar spaces okay so how do we prove that since the set of all similarities from one 
vector space, one Banach space to another Banach space is an open subset, okay, of the continuous linear maps from V to W, all continuous maps. Invertible maps are an open set. This is what we have seen. DF from U to BVW is given to be continuous, okay, by replacing u by a smaller neighborhood of v0, if necessary, we can assume that dfv is similar for all v inside u. Okay, all that I have made is, you know, the map is continuous. Okay, df, and at v0 it goes to a similarity, and similarity is contained inside an open subset here. We have denoted by A, A, V, W. So you take an open subset going inside that by continuity. And that open subset, let us now rewrite it as U. We don't want the bigger U at all. So the assumption is that starting with one, one at one point it is invertible. We are assuming that for all V inside U, DFV is invertible. Is a similarity. Okay. Next step in the implicit function theorem above, we take y equal to w. Okay. So we are in the part b already. Remember, part b of implicit function theorem wanted us to be that y to be a Banach space. So we are taking much special case y as the w itself. Okay, take y naught as f of v naught. V naught is given. Now, what is y naught? Don't worry, worry about other points. Take y naught f of v naught. Now you take capital F from w to u, w cross u to w. In fact, some neighborhood of of y naught and v naught I should take to w. But I can define it this map from the whole of W cross U W given by F of W V is W minus F V. Very simple function. Okay, capital F. This is what we are going to apply the implicit function theorem for. Then F is continuously differentiable as a function of V. That's what we wanted, first of all. In fact, this is continuously differentiable even in terms of W also. So all the hypotheses that we needed are satisfied. For each W inside W, the derivative of this function, namely when W is fixed, V going to F of W is minus of DF. And minus of DF at V naught is a similarity. So all the hypotheses of implicit function theorem are satisfied. The first part says there is a neighborhood M prime of W of F V naught and a row positive such that for each W inside M prime, there is a unique G W. Uh, there I have to Y, Y, Y and so on. Now Y is W. So I am writing place G W belonging to B row bar such that f of w g w is 0. But what is f of g w w g w? It is w minus f of g w. w minus f of v, right? v is g w. So what is the meaning of this? This just means that f g is identity on m prime, right? So that is the meaning of this one. Moreover, the part A already tells you that this map G from M prime to B bar is a unique one and part B says it is continuously differentiable at, it is continuous on the whole of it, sorry, it is differentiable at W naught. The second part says it is differentiable at W naught. The first part says it is continuous. Okay, not continuous differentiable. Sorry, that is not correct. So that is what we have. So this is all 
the implicit function theorem applied to the special case. Okay. So, are we through? So, we have to see what is really happening here. The existence of G implies this M prime is inside the image of F. Image of F restricted to the closed ball. See what is it means? There exists for each, each, see map is from M prime F, F is a map from V to some neighborhood of, right? So, something inside W, but I want to say that M prime is covered by F. Each point M prime, namely W, there is a point here, which we call the GW. F of that is M prime. F of that is W. So, this means that M is contained inside the image of F or image of B bar under F. Okay. So that is the meaning of the existence. Therefore, what we take is N to be this open ball intersection with F inverse of M prime. M prime is an open set, open set. So F inverse of M prime is an open set. Intersect with the open ball that is an open subset of V. Clearly, it is a neighborhood of V naught because V naught is inside F inverse of M. Okay. F of V naught is our uh, starting point, this uh, Y naught or W naught, whatever. Okay. So, this is a neighborhood of V naught. The uniqueness of G implies that this map now restricted to N from N to Fn is a bijection because F composite G is identity. We told you that G is the left inverse of F or F is the right inverse of G. Okay. But now G is unique. Okay, so F must be injective also. So F is a bijection with G as its inverse. Okay. Why not? So I have already told you that V naught is inside N and N is open inside V. F from N to Fn is a homeomorphism. But why Fn is open but Fn happens to be just G inverse of M prime. Because G composite F is identity. Okay. So, Fn is also an open subset. Of course, it is a neighborhood of Fv naught. Okay. So, here is the <laughs> picture I have drawn. V to W, this F is a multivalued function. It is not, it is not assumed to be uh, one one map or anything. There is no need for that. Okay. So, what we started? We started with a neighborhood M prime and a neighborhood B rho bar here of corresponding neighborhood. Okay. For each point in M prime, there is a unique G inside this bar. Okay. What is G? F of that is back to M prime here is W. So, go G and come back by F. F of composite G is identity map of this part, which means that this M prime is covered by the image of this one. This is some larger thing. Okay, if you take F of this, it could be larger. It covers M prime. Okay, but for points of M prime, inside this one, there is only one point which is coming to that. That is the that is the uniqueness part of this. Okay, if there are another point here coming here, the uniqueness will fail. Right? But some point here may come here. Some point may here may come here. I don't care. Inside this ball, open ball, there is only one G. Okay? So, therefore, when you take this M prime and inverse of that, okay, inside this one, there may be some other point. I am intersecting it B in the open ball. That is what I am calling it as N. On N to M prime, 
F is a bijection now. And its inverse is G. Okay. And what we know is that G is differentiable at V naught here. Sorry, F V naught here. That is W naught. Okay. G is continuous. F is continuous. They are inverses of each other. Homeomorphism. N is open. M prime is open. But I am not taking the whole of M prime here. What I am taking is F of N. Okay. F of N is open. All right. F of N is also a neighborhood of F V naught. So, only thing that remains is why this G is differentiable on the whole of N. We know it only at one point. Right? What is that point? That point was an arbitrary point of this neighborhood. Okay, the hypothesis is true now for the, all of the points in N. Remember, that was the starting point of our choice of the neighborhood here. Okay, for all, uh, we cut down the neighborhood U itself such that DF is invertible on all the whole of this. So, that hypothesis is there. Therefore, for every point V prime here, I can apply the same theorem to conclude that the inverse exists in some neighborhood, the inverse being a unique map, okay, and it will be differentiable at f of v prime. But inside this neighborhood, g has to be the same map because it has to be the inverse of f. Because f is already one one map. Therefore, G is differentiable at all the points of Fn. Fn. Starting with any point here, the, the same hypothesis is applicable here. Okay. So, this is the last thing I repeat here. So far, we had only proved that G is differentiable at Fv0. But then the same argument applied at each point W prime is Fv prime. Where V prime range is over N will tell you that in some smaller neighborhood, all that is there in the background, we can ignore them. Fv prime contained inside F of N, everything, F is a continuous uh, inverse which is differentiable at F of V prime. F has a continuous inverse that, but continuous inverse, inverse itself is the same G now. There is no other because F is already 1 1 map. But the inverse of F has to be G on all of Fn. Therefore, G is differentiable at Fn on the whole of Fn. Okay. So, final thing is that if you take G composite F, which is identity, so its derivative is also identity, right? identity equal to D of G composite F but all the points U but by chain rule this is DG at F U composite with DF at U which implies if these two functions one is composite other is identity DG of F U is nothing but F U DF U inverse. Okay, and that is equal to by definition of our eta, eta of DFU. Okay, therefore, the continuity of this DG okay, follows from the assumption that DF is continuous and the fact that eta is continuous. Okay as seen in theorem 1.14. Therefore, the derivative is continuous. See, up till here we only show that G is differentiable. If DG is continuous, follows, but DG is given by, by this formula, namely, it is TF 
inverse. So I have said this is the inverse of this one. But this is also true for if you take D of F composite G, F composite G is the order of identity. So it's both ways. Therefore, one is the inverse of the other. Okay. The inverse taking inverse itself is a continuous operation. Therefore, we have that dg as a continuous function. Okay, so that completes the argument, completes all the proofs of all the assertions of uh, the inverse function theorem. So, so theorem 1.14 is proved. So that's all today. So let us stop here.